Hi there, welcome back to Asian Art. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the very important temples of Buddhism. In our last lecture, we talked about the fundamentals of Buddhism, and there was this idea of pilgrims, Buddhists who would travel to these sacred sites, these locations where there would be these stupa. And the stupa was a structure that held within it some portion of the ashes or remains of Buddha. And there were literally thousands of these all across India in its heyday. Uh, today, there are only a few stupa remaining in India as Buddhism has uh, vanished from many parts of the country with the arrival of Islam and the ascendancy of Hinduism. To begin with, we're going to talk about some of the ancient sites of stupas and where they can be found in India today. Kapilavatsu is a very important place, a shrine where the Buddha was born. Bodh Gaya is where he found his enlightenment. Sanchi Stupa in the center is one of the oldest surviving stupa, and Amaravati Stupa in the south is another example of an ancient stupa, now only exists as remains. To begin with, let's look at the Sanchi Stupa. The Sanchi Stupa is a solid structure in case of a dome of rock and has inside it a small cavity containing at one time uh, some portion of the remains of Buddha's ashes. It is based on the idea of a burial mound. In its structure, you can see this building, which dates back to 250 BC, has been made in stone. We have at the top a square uh, walled area called the Harmika, which on top of that are these sort of umbrella shapes that go up into as far as this Harmika is known as the site of the enlightenment. This is sort of our goal uh, to release yourself from attachment to things of this world. To enter the stupa, there is the torana, or gateway. You can see here it has uh, these three horizontal uh, beam-like structures and a sort of entranceway in. It's a richly carved structure. As you walk in, it is sort of the first thing you would see as you approach the stupa. You notice that in the structure of the stupa, there are four gateways, one aligned with the cardinal directions. And then to the south Tirana, there is a stairway. So you would enter from the east, you could walk around the base, and then you come to the south, you could take stairs up to this upper level walkway, and you could walk around that where you'd get a better view of the decorated Tarana Gateway. But there is no interior to the stupa, and there is no way to reach the Harmika at the top. Here, let's take a look at the East Torana. This is where you would approach the stupa from the east when you begin your journey in, and it is from here that you would be welcomed in. Uh, in a sense, as you sort of approach, you find a way to join in the company of the Buddhists uh, assembled there. There on the east bracket, on the right, you can see the figure of a woman who is hanging onto a mango branch. This is a yakshi. We've talked about yakshi. They're quite commonly found in Hindu uh, temples, but here in a Buddhist temple, 
the yakshi is in the pose of Shalabanjika. Now, what this pose is very interesting, if you recall from our previous uh, lecture on Buddhism, when we saw an image of the birth of Buddha, you'll notice that his mother was actually standing in this very pose as she gave birth to Buddha. And that's what's the significance of this pose. It is a symbol of fertility. We've known that yakshis tend to be symbols of fertility, hanging from a mango tree, rich with fruit. Again, a sense of abundance and fertility. You're approaching a temple of Buddhism, which is there to remind you of your ascetic journey uh, toward enlightenment and letting go of worldly pleasures. And yet, on the very first gateway you approach, you see this voluptuous woman beckoning you in. And so this image is not, in a sense, contradictory to the ascetic aims of Buddhism. It's there to say that Buddhism is a path of fertility and prosperity, just like Hinduism. But in this case here, the symbol of, Buddha, of giving birth in Buddhism would also mean that you are being, in a sense, reborn as you walk into uh, the stupa through the torana. So the yakshi, as you see uh, from our earlier Hindu example, is again this idea of a spiritual deity that is there to help us and guide us on our journey toward enlightenment. Here is the earlier example of the birth of Buddha in the pose of Shalabanjika. Now, as you're walking through the temple grounds from the interior, you will see many of these beautifully adorned Tarana panels. And in them, there are many different stories from the life of Buddha and from the life of Ashoka as well. Here we see the story of Gautama Siddhartha's great departure. This is a, an important episode in the life of Gautama, as it was recorded, that uh, he has decided, after having seen the four troubling sights, that he must leave his kingdom behind and begin his ascetic practice. Over on the left of the image, you see the palace where everyone is sleeping. And then you'll see uh, him leaving on a horse as he begins his journey. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that there is a series of five horses. It's all the same horse on this one picture. So in a sense, we're looking at a series of images that tell a sequence of, of events in one picture. So we tend to call this a synoptic narrative. So we have a single picture where there are multiple representations of a single character. The other thing that's very interesting about the way this story is told is we'll notice at the very center of this picture, dividing the composition in half, is uh, the sacred Bodhi tree, this idea of the tree of enlightenment. So this is a, a sort of a suggestion of the theme of this, that, that he is in pursuit of his enlightenment, and that this is his ultimate goal. Uh, and so the sense of uh, it is a symbol of Buddha himself. And uh, the pair of footprints on the far right is another symbol of Buddha. These are his steps as he first puts his feet on the ground and he begins his journey toward enlightenment. You'll notice that his feet have wheels in them. The wheels are the Dharma wheels, the wheels of his teachings. So what's missing here, what you don't see in this composition, is you see the horse, you see symbols of Buddha, but you do not see an actual representation of Buddha. We call this an anaconic representation. 
and iconic representations were the way that Buddha was originally depicted in the earliest art we have, which means they showed symbols of Buddha, but there were no actual depictions of Buddha himself. Now, this may come as a surprise to many of you who, and we have shown already, many different images of Buddha all the way on to the present day. That's true. There are images of Buddha today. But in the beginning, there was a reticence, a sense of uh, it was an inappropriate, perhaps, to not show the Buddha because he was a person who had, in essence, left his body behind. So even though at this point in the story, he has not found enlightenment, they are treating him as a person who is already enlightened. Here is another representation in the anaconic mode, which is a return to Kapilavatsu. This is toward the end of Buddha's life. He has come back to his birthplace and he has come uh, to uh, ask for forgiveness for having left the kingdom behind and not served as their king. And here we see the throne that is empty where the Buddha is seated outside of the kingdom, not inside. And the people are worshipping him and recognizing him as a great teacher. Above the throne where he is seated would be an elephant, another symbol of Buddha, because uh, his mother had a dream of a white elephant before he was born. And so at Amaravati's stupa from the second century, they also use this strategy of symbols of Buddha without actually showing the Buddha himself. Now, this idea of showing the footprints of Buddha rather than showing the Buddha, this is a very old idea that can be found both in stupa and Amaravati. The idea of Buddha's feet is also a symbol that's used uh, to represent Vishnu, Vishnu being this deity who comes down to earth as an avatar. So it seems it's perhaps that the Buddhists took this idea from Hinduism, or perhaps the other way around, Hinduism incorporated it back into its own theology and symbolism after Buddhism. It's not entirely clear which came first. But this idea of footprints representing a deity stepping on earth, or in this case, Buddha and his journey toward enlightenment. Now, if we go back to the stupa, we look down at the plan view of the stupa. We see we come in to the east and the path into the inner area that is gated, that is sort of fenced in here. This is not a straight path. It actually makes this little kind of jog in. You turn, you turn again, and you turn again and you enter the, the stairway. And this, in the four different cardinal directions, creates this kind of broken entryway. Now, the reason for this is that this journey, this kind of not direct journey, is a sacred symbol of the continuation of life, one that reaches way, way back in ancient antiquity. Uh, and the symbol is called the swastika. Now, the swastika, of course, was again another image that the Nazis in Germany took and corrupted to their own evil ends. And it is a symbol that has a great and terrible history of human oppression. So it is a symbol that unfortunately has been diverted from its original intent in our more recent history, but one that for thousands of years was a symbol of the continuity of life. Now let's compare a Hindu temple with a Buddhist stupa. Now, as I mentioned early on, the stupa is solid. 
There is no interior. There's no way to get into or see or experience any kind of deity or approach, you know, some sense of I've reached enlightenment. Unlike the Hindu temple with its gabagriya, the womb house interior where the deity resides, and there's a kind of journey into this inner sanctum where you kind of come before the deity to make your offering. There is no such place in the Buddha stupa. The idea that the remains of Buddha are somewhere inside, and there's the harmika at the top, which is the ultimate goal of enlightenment. But neither can be reached physically. Neither can be approached entirely uh, at this particular juncture. The idea is that you can get closer, you can go up onto the upper level, uh, but you can't actually receive that sense of having arrived at one's enlightenment through this journey alone. In fact, the idea is that this is a process by which you become closer to your goal rather than one that says, this is all you need to do, and thus you are having achieved and finished your goal. And so the emphasis in Buddhism is always on a kind of ongoing process, ongoing journey toward enlightenment, not a sense of you having arrived or having achieved some kind of final point of enlightenment. Another very important aspect of the stupa in its overall design is that it's shaped and laid out in what's called a mandala. A mandala is a sacred design, one that represents a kind of ideal world, a kind of map or plan of what the world would look like if we were enlightened already. And so the stupa represents this idea of an ideal world. Now, if you'll notice, there are four cardinal directions and gateways that approach this kind of center that is surrounded by this circle. So the idea of the square, harmika at the top, at the very innermost center of this mandala, if I were to blow it up, you would see a Buddhist deity known as Kala Chakra. Now, this is a special variety of Tibetan Buddhism that has evolved on its own for hundreds of years. This particular painting was done in the 10th century, but there are many, many different kinds of mandala and many different kinds of designs, all with a sense of sort of symmetry and the deity residing at the center of the design. If we think about the mandala, it's really a kind of map or plan view of a temple. Here is a kind of three-dimensional rendering, sort of giving you the idea of what it would kind of look like if we could see it sort of elevated with these sort of gateways coming into up into this sacred center. Now, in Tibet, there is a very important kind of practice whereby they make mandalas out of sand. These are not painted or glued down. They are carefully applied by rubbing a trough very fast, and the vibrations in the trough draw the colored sand down the trough and carefully laid in place. Even a sneeze could terribly uh, distort or alter the pattern that is laid down over weeks as they build out this sacred design. So the practice, the meditation, you see here several monks here with their colored sand to participate and build out this mandala, is the process of making this image is a way of coming closer to realizing and envisioning this enlightenment. And by 
doing this, by making this, they get closer toward their enlightenment. It's a, a kind of a way of teaching people about mandalas, but it's also a way for the monks themselves to practice their knowledge of this sacred space. So the sun mandala is interesting because it ultimately teaches this idea of impermanence. Once the design is finished, prayers are said, and then it's swept up. And there's a sense that, that it's time to build a new one. This process is an ongoing development toward one's enlightenment. Okay. Let's move on to our review, Kliz. Remember, if any of the questions here um, seem confusing or difficult, be sure to go back and check over the lecture again. Question one. What is the significance of the Harmika? What is an iconic representation? What is the meaning of the bracket Yakshi on the Tarana? Why is the stupa designed like a mandala? How is a stupa different from a Hindu temple? That's all for today. See you online.